Welcome to Martial Wisdom. Here you can listen to conversations on all kinds of topics related to martial arts. Today's topic is, did Aikido come from the Japanese battlefield? Joining me in this discussion is Ellis Amder. Before we get started, please consider supporting this podcast by liking and sharing it. If you're interested in even more content, please consider subscribing to the Spirit Aikido online program. I'm proud to announce that the program currently has over 260 videos. Another option is to contribute any amount you like through the PayPal tip jar. Even small contributions are greatly appreciated. I hope you enjoy this episode. Now, on with the discussion. Welcome back to Modern Aikido's podcast and Martial Wisdom. Um, we got a great episode today with Ellis Amder. I'm, I'm happy to have, have him back to the show. And we're going to be talking about uh, kind of a sequel to our uh, previous discussion that we had on Aikido's history and background, and that was episode uh, 167. Uh, we're going to go farther back this time uh, based on the belief that uh, Aikido came from the Japanese battlefield. And this is something that I think is very commonly believed among Aikido practitioners, and we want to dig into it a bit to find out is that is that true or what part of it is true or what part may not be accurate. Um, so, Ellis, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks very much. Excellent. Well, you know, in our last discussion, you talked to a, gr a great length about uh, Morihai Ueshiba's background and even back to Sakaku Takeda, um, who was back into late 1800, or I'm sorry, late uh, 1900, or late 1800s in the early 1900s. Um, but there was really no Japanese battlefield at that time that covered hand-to-hand -hand combat the way that we typically think of, you know, the, the statement that Aikido goes back to the Japanese battlefield. And, and that's what we wanted to discuss. And um, just to let listeners know, Ellis and I had a, a bit of a, a pre-discussion about this to go, well, how far back do we want to go? And it was a fascinating discussion that goes, we can trace that, you know, the samurai warfare back, you know, a thousand years or more, and, and with any history, you learn about it in the fact that that with any period of history, it, it helps to find out what came before to explain what happened, uh, you know, in sequence. So maybe let's go back from where our previous discussion le left off, which was Sakaku Takeda, and as I understand it, he was a very he was a child, basically very young uh, young boy when the reformation happened he was exposed to adults at that time who were part of that that reformation war but he never was on a japanese battlefield himself is is that accurate well when we talk about takeda sokaku's uh history it's despite a tremendous amount being written about him Mm -hmm. uh, it's not well documented in a lot of respects. There are a lot of gaps about where he was, when, and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful researcher named Mark Trudell who's really doing great work in, in bringing things to light right now. But, and there's also a problem that what we consider history, and even in my book, Hidden in Plain Sight, I'm relying on things like Takeda Tokumune's recollections of what his father told him uh you know and and so how much of that is accurate or poorly remembered or sokaku mythologized himself there's a lot we don't know the story is that during the boshin war which was uh uh at the inception of uh, the meiji period where there was a battle between different feudal domains that were supporting the Tokugawa shogunate and those supporting the um, imperial line. And the last holdout for the Tokugawa shogunate was the, uh, among them was the Aizu uh, uh, Han, which was associated with the Takeda family. And it was a remarkable war in that modern weapons were used. Um, I, gosh, I forgot her name right now, but there was a woman who, there's a very famous story about a woman who led a battalion of Naginata fighters, and they were basically slaughtered when they ran into uh, uh, enemy ranks with rifles. These are part of the Eisen. But there was another woman whose name, I, it's, it's just not in my mind right now, um, 
who was a sniper using a Sharps rifle, firing from the battlements of the castle. She survived and later became the headmistress of a women's college in Kyoto, you know, and lived a long, productive life, became a Christian. I mean, there were these remarkable stories. So you had a battlefield that on the one hand was using modern weapons, cannon and Sharps rifles, and still there were people fighting with swords. Uh, one of the remarkable bits of data is among the imperial line were fighters of Jigenyu. And Jigenyu is this incredibly simple, powerful sword school where they practice essentially beating trees until they die with a uh, boken. Mm -hmm. And there were members of the Aizu side found dead with the back edge of their sword, the mune, planted in their skull. What that means is the Jigenyu guy comes down and struck with such power that the person blocking had their own weapon, mm. blunt edge, driven into their skull, fracturing the skull, and they died. Mm. So, and interestingly, because you know, I do all these tangents, there's all the debate about do you spar and things like that. The Jigenyu guys don't spar. They just attack trees, and they have some pretty simple kata but they practice for intensity and power and non-hesitation, right? So it's, it's, it's an interesting little sidelight in that. Sure. But so that war was a mixture of utterly so-called traditional weaponry and modern weaponry. And allegedly, according to Takeda Sokaka's own account, he's a little boy of eight or nine, and he went wandering on the battlefield. Hmm. Um, and there are these accounts of uh, uh, his father said how he liked, he was fascinated looking at the dead bodies. There was cannibalism going on because the uh, soldiers were not supplied with the, any rations. Um, uh, supposedly, he observed things like that. Um, so, and, 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 you know, I write about a lot of Takeda's very paranoid sounding behavior if you look at young children who are put in war zones today, be it, take, take your pick, surely in a short time in Ukraine, but kids come out of Lebanon, out of Burma, out of God knows where, traumatized children who witness battlefield horror often grow up to have difficulty with relationships, they're hyper suspicious, they're argumentative, in other words, complex PTSD, and I don't want to over psychologize, but Takeda Sokaka's subsequent behavior certainly is congruent with what you would expect of a little boy who wandered alone on a battlefield. Mm. He didn't fight, of course, because he was a child. Right. Um, so he had experience of hand to hand combat. There was a, a, a famous episode sometime in the 1890s where he was in the Meiji period, you know, traditional Japanese culture was really denigrated. Mm. And he was strutting around with a very long sword and he was a very short man. If he was five feet tall, one was surprised. Mm -hmm. And so there, I think there were these jokes about a sword taking a little man for a walk. <laughs> and so he passed this construction site and construction workers were at that time were guilds mm. and they certainly overlapped with gangsters at the time. And so people started yelling at Takeda and making fun of him and words were exchanged. And so the story goes, he was attacked by a crowd of men using construction tools, axes, uh, uh, other, other kinds of weapons like that. And if I recall correctly, he's alleged to have killed 11 or 12 of them uh, was rescued at the last minute by his uncle. He had uh, numerous wounds. He was tried and, again, this is how the story goes, allegedly found innocent uh, self-defense. Hmm. So then there are other stories that go on um, and they get even more legendary, but supposedly he was up in Hokkaido routing back gangsters and things like that. So uh, there's stories like that. As far as true battlefield, the only battlefield he set foot on, if he did, if that story is true, was as a small child wandering around. Mm. Okay.
Yeah, and I think this the, that the you know within the development of warfare, the the modern modern weapons of the cannon and the firearm is a a pretty strong threshold for we can assume that that hand to hand combat was no longer a primary battlefield tool, whereas prior to that, you know, although you could argue with archery that that was kind of the earlier version of the gun and samurais were primarily their their lineage was uh, archers before they were swordsmen and yeah. that was the primary weapon as i understand it <clears throat> um and that kind of opens up the, the big question of was uh what what did the japanese battlefield look like in terms through the lens of hand-to-hand -hand combat was it a, a point where there what were what we would count as the the throws and the techniques that are associated with with modern aikido or jujitsu um i think that uh in terms of battle, if you look throughout the world, warfare was not a bunch of hand-to-hand -hand combats generally, even as far back as the Romans. It was a unit combat that consisted of, of systems put together. And you could those systems would be, for example, the use of scutum shields uh, with, a, with spears behind them, uh, like a Greek pha phalanx type of a configuration or the use of these, these types of things. And one thing that strikes me is that Throughout most of those other cultures, in fact, I can only think of a couple of exceptions, a two-handed sword alone was really not a battlefield weapon system. It just was not very practical for that. Um, the exception, one of the major exceptions I can think of is the, the Lanschnecks from uh, middle of Europe. They use these, they call them Zweihanders or giant great swords, very long swords, but they were part of a bigger system. They were in support of spears that would be used as a line to keep uh, for example, shieldmen from rushing the spears and getting past the point to where the spear, the spear wielders were now vulnerable. So it was kind of a, almost a threshing machine where you had the blades coming down from the top to protect the spear fighters and keep their opponents at range while the spear points could do their damage. Um, and, and one thing that, that I've always found curious is that the Japanese, for as much as they did warfare through their history, they never developed really the, uh, the use of a shield the way you've seen it in other cultures. Um, they used what would look like a shield uh, in Europe. I think they call these a, a, a pavis. I think that's how it's pronounced, which is like, a, a, imagine a scutum shield set on the ground with a prop that you stood behind. And that would be where your arrows were. And you could duck behind it if you needed protection, but you'd stand up and then fire your arrows. They were primarily like an archer support tool. Mm -hmm. um, and, and therefore, you know, if we look at the samurai being primarily archers and they're, they're I think this the second to, to look at is the spearmen, the Ashigaru, who were usually spearmen, sometimes halberdiers, or, you know, they, they would fight with Naginata or Nagimachi. Um, the sword was really, uh, the two-handed sword was, was not something I would want to take against somebody with a, with a halberd. Uh, it, it's, it's inferior in range um range control uh, things like that i wouldn't uh, it's uh, against even a, a de somewhat decent spear fighter you're at a severe disadvantage um but that's what made me think of you know okay you start painting the picture of this is how units on a battlefield would often engage with each other where does jujitsu and throws and the joint locks that we look at mo our modern aikido jujitsu judo fit into that and I, I i don't know the answer to that it would be at best probably a backup if you did get somebody penetrated your line or you got caught behind an, a, a line of enemy and you were in that bad breath range where you had to deal hand to hand but that certainly wouldn't be the optimal for an army or a, a an organized uh, group engagement so i think we should start at the beginning Yes, we can, this covers quite a bit. Okay, but one point uh, that I'm just going to throw in there and drop, we'll come back to it. And the one point is, um, aside from conditions which dictate the kind of combat, combative form you develop, mm -hmm. for example, uh, there's a, uh, a form of Indonesian sila called harimau, which I believe is a word for tiger. And it almost looks like capoeira, uh, 
they don't have the prescription against your core body, your buttocks or whatever, touching the ground like they do in capoeira. But it's very similar looking in some respects. And it's, they live in very swampy territory. And so if you're doing upright fighting, the understanding is you're going to slip and fall. Right? So they have, they developed a specific combative form for local conditions. So there's that sort of thing. The other thing is we humans, when it comes to survival, are innately conservative. If something, so for example, if I've never been in a fight and you attack me and I go, ah, like that, mm -hmm. and I survive, that informs my brain, that's what you should do. I'm more likely to repeat it. And that's why, you know, for example, uh, say jujitsu, uh, one of the first things you learn when you're rolling is not to stiffen your arms because you get locked out over and over again. Uh, the first thing you, well, the first things you learn boxing, you don't stick your chin up, right? Or lower your hands. And you have to, you have to be taught that against what your brain believes will keep you safe. You are literally in an argument with yourself, but the deepest part of yourself that you have to retrain like a pseudo instinct. In addition is culture. There's a cultural inertia. So um, I've read about combat in the South Seas where um, the warriors of uh, Polynesia, Micronesia, et cetera, would, the best weapon they had aside from a spear was, um, uh, and in some places they didn't have spear because they didn't have long enough uh, good wood they would have a shark tooth club. And so your go-to technique is definitely gonna be an overhand swing. Because with a shark tooth club, yeah, you would lacerate flesh, but if you're cutting this way, you're, you want not only the laceration, but you want an impact to knock that person down, out, shatter them. And when they fought with uh, Europeans, the Europeans were ducking in and stabbing. And over and over again, winning when it would come to that infight. There was one story I read about a, a shipwrecked English sailor who ended up allegedly the chief of this whole area because when he was attacked, he kept ducking low and stabbing people in the gut with this knife that he managed to carry with him off the ship. And people couldn't uncouple what they believe combat to be, even though a new element had come in. So from the outside, you could say, well, gee, it looks really obvious that they should have developed spear fighting. But I think we'll, we'll go through and see how um, there was cultural inertia and some practical reasons for that. Mm -hmm. When the Japanese saw a practical reason to change, the, the, the speed in which they changed, uh, which again, I'm, this is just an aside, then we'll sort of go back in time. The speed in which firearms were developed and plate armor when it was shown how to make it, boom. Yeah, Nobunaga wearing plate armor. They just said, oh, this is better. I will take the Spanish style. Okay, so that was my little aside. So let's go back. Um, once upon a time. Once upon a time, Japan was uh, a, a landmass of islands with very, very small tribes. Many of them hunter-gatherer tribes. Um, which means they're going to be very limited in population. Uh, on the seacoast, some of those tribes were bigger because um, the accessibility of shellfish in particular meant that there wasn't the same limitation of access to protein that most hunter-gatherer people have. If you have to hunt warm-blooded animals, Pretty much when your tribe gets above 40, even in a plentiful environment, there's not enough game to supply you with protein. The tribe tends to split up, go two ways, et cetera. But on a sea coast, Japan, uh, Pacific Northwest, they had little nations that were hunter-gatherer nations uh, because uh, literally you could almost lie on the beach and wait for the salmon to swim under the beach. There were so many of them. Right. Similarly, the oyster middens were almost, uh, you know, the oyster, uh, these mounds of, shell, uh, of oyster shells were like little mountains in certain areas of the seacoast, piled up generation after generation. 
can imagine how badly it stunk. You had to get used to that. But so you had these little nations, tiny little mini nations, which were hunter gatherer. Um, and they go back very far in time and probably like hunter gatherer people the world over, they would have skirmishes that would, we call skirmishes, they would have wars in which maybe one or two people would kill and then they would break. Mm -hmm. And people make the mistake of saying, oh, so somehow this fight was recreational. And that's not true at all. If you have 20 people in your tribe and one person dies, you've lost 5% of your population. Mm -hmm. It was devastating, right? Um, the other thing that people mistake is one of the ways of warfare in a lot of so-called primitive peoples where projectile weapons are thrown is one of the ways you would get your manhood out there, particularly when you're young, is going out front and dodging and things like that, which would functionally uh, expose the enemy. It would also uh, uh, get them to expend their weaponry, things like that. Um, and there was also you know, you would increase yourself in status where social capital was very important. So it wasn't playful. It just, to an outsider who doesn't understand it, it may look playful, it's deadly serious. But so you just had these hunter-gatherer folks. Then you had a wave of immigration over hundreds of years and coming mostly through uh, uh, Korea, although some may have come from the South, from the Philippines and other islands like that, because there's an element of what is now referred to as melee uh, 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 DNA. Uh, I, I can't remember the technical term, Polynesian slash melee DNA in Japan. You also had in the far north, a different people, uh, the remnants of them called the Ainu, but there were more tribes who had a completely different uh, sort of DNA. Uh, one of the things that these people brought was agriculture. And different forms, particularly of rice cultivation, which means you're gonna be able to make bigger population groups. Mm -hmm. There you know, the, there are these legends of warfare uh, in the Nihon Shoki and the Kojiki between the tribal people who were originally there and these other tribes. Uh, eventually these immigrants came bringing wet uh, paddy uh, um, uh, rice cultivation mm -hmm. and horses. And there's a lot not known still about this period. You know, it wasn't, what it wasn't was one group that came over. It was a wave of immigrants who may be related, at least in culture, to the Turkic tribes. That whole step, swathe of steps people, which went all the way from uh, uh, beyond Ukraine into uh, Eastern Europe all the way over the steppes, all the way probably to Japan, horse riding people who are archers. Mm. Okay. Um, and they began warfare, which was, they had straight swords, which was a sidearm, and primarily archery. And they would have these uh, uh, battles. They also had pole arms. And the pole arms are called the main ones were called Hoko, and the other one we have the character for it, but nobody knows how to pronounce it. It could be pronounced Hoko as well. So it's usually called Ka. And so the Ka was a pole arm which had at right angles a, uh, a kind of a pick. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was very unusual. And, you know, they're not much found, and they're mostly found in southern Japan in the island of Kyushu in burial mounds and things like that. The Hoko was a spear which was socketed. Mm. Uh, the problem with a socketed spear is, you know, it's at the end of a pole with certain leverage, it could be broken out. So it wasn't the most solid implement. Mm -hmm. Now, but, what was the purpose of the socket? What, did it serve a function? Yeah, that's so socketed steel, um, which fitted onto the, uh, the shaft and then it would be secured with some pins or something like that. Okay. okay? Sure. Yeah, the two ways you, you can make a weapon, generally speaking, is you have a socket onto the shaft or you have a tang, which is tang, inserted yep. into the shaft. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so over a period of time, these one, one group in particular referred to as the Yamato men started to consolidate Japan 
they then had warfare in the hinterlands against people they called the Emishi, some of whom were surely culturally the same group. Others were tribal groups who'd been pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. Okay. Um, in about 600, the Japanese, approximately 500, 600, they began to emulate Chinese culture. They had a, they started uh, with a conscript army and we can see uh, what kind of weaponry they would wear and armor they would wear in these little clay figures called Haniwa, um, where they had a kind of plate armor, war horse, uh, they, they were on horseback and they had plate armor. Um, the, and they fought in to some degree in ranks with these conscripts. But there were problems because these were not willing fighters. They were, they were taken off their farms. They were taken off you know, wherever they lived and they had to owe some military service. And at a certain point, this system began to break down. But essentially you had people who they would fight on foot and on horseback with archery mm -hmm. and they had ranks of spearmen. Okay. Uh, for close in combat, they had a straight sword, okay. pretty much. Um, so the conscript system broke down, but also the country was pretty well uh, consolidated and there was a period of peace, relative peace. Again, skirmishes in the hinterlands, but you know, in the, uh, uh, up in the, the early Heian period, things were going pretty well, but um, what started to happen in the hinterlands, if you're fighting on a regular basis, you sort of become a warlord and people would, they would band together uh, because of the particular social structure around the imperial family. There are a lot of concubines, a lot of children were being born with some degree of imperial blood. What do you do with them? You send them out, you're, you're a fifth cousin, you get sent out to the hinterlands, you've got some status, you've got some imperial blood, you become the war leader. And so what started to build up is different feudal domains. Um, these were the most efficient fighters. And they started to specialize in what you mentioned earlier, truly in, in horse archery. Now, if you were fighting primarily as an archer, that's your, and this is, horses were at a premium in Japan. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, fodder. So you got to have money and land to have a horse. Um, so the people on horseback were a nobility. They had more money. If you were primarily an archer, you're not also going to be carrying a shield. You're going to have a form of armor which should best protect you against arrows while being maneuverable. And they came up with a kind of laminar armor that we're rather familiar with, that these strips of uh, iron which uh, uh, were bound with uh, uh, silk, and sometimes uh, other other media, right? So they're, they're bound together. This kind of this kind of armor, uh, and particularly a glancing blow would not penetrate, right? And you're able to maneuver on horseback very well. You've got flaps on your shoulder. Uh, now it's exposed under the arms, in between the legs, and things like that. But you're riding a horse, and you're not raising your arms. So they had the. Uh, uh, um, bow and arrow. In addition, they had a sword which some, some along the line Japanese discovered this wonderful way to curve the sword, this forged sword. And it was called a tachi, referred to as a tachi. Um, and this was a weapon that in close combat, you would in theory be slashing from side to side uh, to cut your way free from, from enemy ranks or cutting down the foot soldiers. The foot soldiers, at that time, the hoko had been abandoned for various reasons. Don Drager theorizes because the socketed spear was so weak. My guess is that there was a period of peace and when people started looking at weapons, the, the curved sword was so fascinating that they started saying, well, how about a curved sword with an extension? And now you have a naginata. Mm. I go into a lot of detail uh, on this in the book Old School, but I, I just, just, so we, the proper just, just before you jump into that, one of the things that that I recall reading, and it's been quite a few years since I was big into 
uh, Japanese warfare, especially their the armor and weapons, what I had read was that it was when they shifted from a two-bladed sword, like a typical European, they went to the, because that the, those tended to be a bit more brittle because the iron was of mm -hmm. not, it was somewhat inferior quality compared to something like Damascus steel or Toledo. Um, yeah. In order to have a more sturdy blade, they put an edge on one, one side and the back, the spine was thicker. When they mm -hmm. went to temper it, the, the thinner part of the blade kind of expanded and the curve was sort of a happy accident that happened because of the, the unevenness from the, the thicker spine to the thinner blade. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a, a trait of the metallurgy part of how it, how it acted when it went through the, the tempering process. I, I'm not a, a, an expert on this. I, I, it makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. um, you look at the old swords from the early Nara period before, you did have these uh, more delicate two-edged swords, which people wore as civilians as well. There are early examples of straight one-edged swords. Mm -hmm. And then the, the curved sword appeared. Uh, uh, Kogarasu Maru. The first sword, little crow sword, as is the first one known. Um, and it's interesting because it's not a beautiful curve. It's actually, it curves and then sort of swoops up. It's Oh yeah, I've seen those, yep. Yeah, it was the first attempt, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, the foot soldiers had naginata. Mm -hmm. um, because of the social structure of Japan at that time, the foot soldiers names weren't known. They were auxiliary troops. They may be even more important in certain battlefields, but they weren't important in a lot of ways because killing the leader was what was important. Uh, uh, get it, one, because of the reward you would get for doing so, the head you took, but also the, the way the troops at that time were led, uh, particularly in the early days, um, you decapitated the army by taking out the leader. So what was most significant was who shot whom with a bow. This has been overblown though. You know, people have this fantasy that each guy was yelling, here's my name. I want somebody of equal rank. We, I challenge you. There were certainly guys running in front of, riding in front of the troops yelling their name. That was happening. But they were really fighting war and they were stabbing people in As the back. As opposed to challenging to duels, essentially. Right, there were people who would challenge, come out, come on, here I am. That happened, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the center of the battle. The center of the battle was people trying to kill each other en masse. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so the, 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 at that time, if you will, the main weapons were uh, uh, bow and arrow, horseback riders, uh, and naginata, which you can use to stab with, but it's the way it's built is it is a cutting weapon. You start to develop heavy naginata in a certain period of time they were referred to as nagamaki, which has two meanings. The one is it's just a massive naginata. The other is it's a sword, a rather long sword with a rather long uh, um, hand brain, handguard, not handguard, uh, shaft. So it would have three feet of handle and three feet of blade. Mm -hmm. But other naginata would have five or six feet of handle, shaft, and a two foot blade. It'd just be really super heavy. Right. The, the terms are pretty loose in those days. Mm -hmm. At any rate, um, now, your first question. So was there hand-to-hand -hand combat? Of course there was. Sure, all warfare has some measure of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Right, right. Because your ranks crash together, somebody falls down, drags somebody down, you've got hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, because the only method of uh, uh, reward was presenting a head, I could be in the middle of taking your head, but you ain't dead. You roll over and now we're fighting in a grapple. Right. So those things were definitely happening. You get in close, you grab and stab. Right? And you can see some artifact of that. There's a school called Yagyu Shinganyu, which uh, um, you can see some of their oyoroi, their kata, which are heavy armor against heavy armor. And you see how they will do movements where they put the tip of the sword in the crack of the armor and sort of pry it open, almost like a can opener to get the blade in the right place. Mm -hmm. So that stuff did occur. If there was organized training at that time, there must've been, but we don't have records of it. Sure. 
very little records. There are general accounts, but very little records. Mm -hmm. So next big thing that happened was the Mongol invasion. Uh, and I'm going to go before you jump to that, a thought occurs yeah. to me, I think it's worth covering here. And that is that this is something what you talk about is echoed in European medieval combat, which is you do have the fact that if somebody's armored, you can't not you can't just use a sword on them and assume that it will work. But throwing somebody to the ground who is armored will put you in a great position because just the ground, them hitting the ground will usually rattle them up in addition to putting them in a disadvantaged position. So this would be where the throws that modern martial arts use in terms of dashing somebody to the ground, you don't have to worry about, can you either get a weapon or, or harm them enough through some kind of a strike to stun them, to overcome them. You use the, the impact with the ground to do that. And through, through a helmet and armor, they don't really help you out when you hit the ground. That's right. much less if you turn them over and hit and dropped them on their head, which is, as I've read it, a lot of what the throws of the medieval era uh, before the Re Reformation were there for. Just getting somebody on the ground alone was not enough. You would rather just break their neck and kill them with that throw sure. than have to fiddle around. And you, can jump see, that one. you can see those kind of topsy turvy throws. Yagushingan you again, mm -hmm. you know, Rakiryu, where he basically gets a crotch and shoulder hold, you dump them. Mm -hmm. uh, Irimi-nage, mm -hmm. stepping on the person's foot and shoving them. You know, so very, very simple, simple throws. What there weren't was hip throws. There mm -hmm. were hip throws in Japanese culture at the time in sumo. Mm -hmm. And remember, throughout all of this, people were doing sumo. Mm -hmm. Sumo was uh, 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 both a sacred art because it was enacted at festivals uh, in many cultures, wrestling or other combatives is uh, you shed some blood for the gods. And also the, the fighting is uh, for the pleasure of the gods. Mm -hmm. So uh, sumo is associated with festivals, mm -hmm. but it also was a day-to-day -day recreational activity by just about any Japanese male and who knows how many females. The sumo ring was uh, banned to women because they were considered polluting at that time. Uh, in fact, even up to modern times. But outside of the ring, do you think that peasant girls used to wrestle sometimes? I think so, for sure, sure. right? Well, and, and every, every culture has had some form of wrestling, whether you call it, call it folk wrestling or whether they did it for entertainment or just even, you know, kind of like puppies wrestling with each other. They're learning combat, but in a safe enough environment where they're not harming one another to get used yeah. to that. And some of it, you know, stayed as wrestling. Some of it kind of even started to evolve into ethnic dance, but that's getting off another tangent. Right. But, uh, right. but wrestling, I mean, culture to culture, almost all of them have it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it's obviously there was some hand to hand combat. Now, at this time, uh, we start to, well, when there's actually records of how people were trained, that comes later. But there's absolutely no doubt. Let's say you and I get together after a battle and say, man, you wouldn't believe what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, my sword broke or my, my, my spear broke. And I, I slipped, I'm on one knee. This guy comes up and I, I managed to do a double leg. I got down, I kneeled on his head and, right? Mm -hmm. And these things, and, and you go, wait, wait, wait a minute. Nah, you did not. Look, I'll show you. Right. And that's how things were passed around in those days, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And if, if it was viable, hey, man, I'm going to practice that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, but anyways, go ahead. So, at a certain point, and I think we're in the 1200s, but whenever the Mongols arrived, mm -hmm. uh, allegedly, uh, aside from the typhoon, uh, typhoons saving the Japanese, the way the Mongols fought was a shock. Uh, they fought much more in ranks. They, they had better military organization. Mm -hmm. And this is so, even though most of the Mongols were not Mongols, they were mostly uh, Koreans and Chinese who were impressed in Mongol troops. Mm -hmm. But they, they were a more organized army and they used spear. So some people theorize that it was after the Mongol invasion that the Japanese took another look at, hey, you know what? Spears are pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps the main reason is um, with the Naginata, our ranks have to be really wide apart. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. 
Whereas a spear, you could line up, you could line up in the room I'm sitting in now, you could line up a rank of 20 spearmen. Mm -hmm. Whereas now you're not the fighters, you could have just a space, not on ceiling, two. Mm -hmm. Two as opposed to 20, right? So it, it's really a force amplifier. So and the effect is amazing. I mean, even the, the the Swiss pike line when you when you take a variable length of spears. So now you can even stack more in because you're layering mm -hmm. them and you create like a porcupine, mm -hmm. um, which is much more daunting than than a handful of halberdiers or or polearm fighters. Yeah, yeah. So so we started the Japanese started to fight in much larger troops as the armies got bigger the cavalry became less important because you had more people and you weren't going to get the same number of horses. The horse, by the way, was little more than a pony. Mm. Uh, they weren't very big at all. They were very aggressive. Mm. The Japanese horses have always been known to be an aggressive horse, the pack horses, and anything, but they did kick and things like that. Mm. Um, but so cavalry was used, much like cavalry has been used uh, uh, as an attack squad, a sudden attack squad, sometimes used to flank uh, you know, ranks and things like that. There was still the archery. Archery was not only on horseback. There's one remnant school uh, in Kyushu uh, where they actually show not all that remarkable, but marching in rank with archery, dropping to one knee, one guy firing, another guy reloading and moving forward, advancing. Mm. Uh, I think I've uh, seen some of those demonstrations. Uh, YouTube's got a few videos of them. I right. Right. Yeah. And that's the last remnant of actual ranked archery. Mm. Right. Um, so warfare started to become more and more uh, uh, organized. There are accounts as the centuries pass, we get up close towards the 15th century, 16th century, of training of spearmen. And this is separate from what everybody thinks of the yuha. They would take a bunch of spearmen out to a river, stand them in waist high water. So now you're training your route. And basically they'd raise the spear up and do sabuti by smacking the spear over and over again in the water. Mm. So you're building power while maintaining stability. And, and the other important thing, which people don't really get, functioning in unison by command. Mm. And that's huge. Unit, unit cohesion is so uh, <laughs> personal skills are one thing, but acting as a group is yeah. crucial. And people don't realize how important, um, you know, marching in cadence, you, doing all those fancy drills where you march and, you know, swivel in each thing. It's not so much um, that's your battlefield tactic. It's training a bunch of individual human beings to function like a machine. Right? Your instinct is run away. You know, when you go to so-called tribal people, they were called cowards by um, uh, the advanced civilization because when the English, whoever would mass in a group and charge, the, uh, the whomever, whatever tribe, they'd run away. Oh, they're cowards. No, they're, they're smart. Conservative, uh, you could say. That's save right. your life rather than risk dying. Save your life and we'll ambush you from behind a tree later, mm -hmm. right? as opposed to my honor says it's one against 50. I'm going to march forward and throw myself on the point of the sword. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, when we start to become a military, when we become soldiers, we have to do things that are absolutely against nature, against instinct. Mm -hmm. Right. And we're trained to do that. So the Japanese, like any other culture, their heiho, their tactical methods were to train soldiers to fight in ranks and all the rest. And I think that echoes even as far back as the, the ancient Greeks. They were wise enough to know, all right, as a group, we, we stay tight, we have better protection, and we are more effective. Like that is a formula of warfare. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you read about the training for phalanx and all of that. It's, you know, very much so, you know, how you stay together no matter what. You don't get broken apart. Mm -hmm. So at any rate, the battles became huge. 10,000 soldiers, 20,000, 30,000, 50,000 on a side. Mm -hmm. um, and it was mostly spear-based. The sword was a sidearm. Somewhere along the line, by the way, 
uh, um, when foot soldiers became more important, uh, they would also carry a sword short or long as a sidearm. And now because you're, it's a single edged curved weapon, the tachi is curved side, blade side down because you're drawing up and cutting down from horseback. Hmm. But if you're on the ground, you're cutting here. So in a single drawn cut, you're gonna be cutting the person. So the katana, which had a different set of mountings, it was designed differently in the uh, 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 scabbard, mm -hmm. um, was a weapon that was used to cut in a single blow. Now, uh, one thing that immediately gets mystified here is EI, sword drawing. Mm -hmm. I asked a, a scholar of European martial arts if he could find any account anywhere in the European history of combatives of people using EI techniques. Mm -hmm. which, and, which is a draw and a, to a blow in one motion. Right, and the only thing he found was there was an account in the Song of Roland that somebody got pissed off and the guy draws one inch and his friend says, stop, another inch and it's a murder. Mm. Right. The, legally speaking, if he draws right. that for that, you know, so it, kind of a thin reference on that one, but yeah, it's I can see it. right, it's the right. only thing you got. That. <laughs> right. So I'll come back to the EI in a moment, but but uh, again, spear the main weapon. Some people were still using naginata because there was a considerable still individualism. You could equip yourself. Mm -hmm. um, also, there's one. Uesugi Kenshin, who was one of the great warlords of the uh, uh, 16th century, um, he had a squad of, I believe it was 100 or 150 Nagamaki fighters, mm -hmm. again, the giant Naginata. And they functioned much like what you referred to earlier, the Lanfne, mm -hmm. that they were massive, powerful guys attacking a rank of spears that are out like, you know, hedgehog quills, and they're cutting down and breaking the spears. They're like a, a, a shock troop to break a line, right? Um, but the, the, the Naginata became more and more unusual as we get into the 14th, 15th, 16th century spear. And then in 1543, I believe it was the Portuguese landed on a small island, showed these, uh, I don't pronounce it right, arquebesque or, or anyway, muskets. Oh yeah, the Archibus. Yep. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they uh, uh, um, they traded. They left two of them to the daimyo of this island, who basically told his sword maker, <laughs> "Reproduce this. Perfect. <laughs> we want right. more of these." <laughs> right. And you know, in the amazing short period of time, firearms spread throughout Japan, mm -hmm. and they started studying ranked fire. Right where again you have your shields. Mm -hmm. So. Going back to a question you sort of discussed earlier, so one of the reasons that they did not have a study of shield is because sword fighting on the battlefield was not a major form of combat. They weren't tilting, you know, like uh, the European knights. Mm -hmm. The spears they used were long spears, so they're not doing a short spear like a, you know this kind of this kind of fighting. Mm -hmm. It's a, a, a long spear, maybe four meters long, sometimes five meters long, giant spears. Even the shorter spears, uh, uh, 10 feet, three, three meters, right? So as, as combat developed, it just, in a sense, didn't come to mind because their combatants were developing a certain way. Um, so by the end of the 1600s, uh, I'm sorry, 1500s, when it was the peak of Japanese warfare, you had musketry, archery, spear fighting, and you did have close combat. So that was my fast sort of arc. And now we get into jujitsu. And one of the best schools to discuss this, well, well, actually, before I do, now we have to address one other issue. And that is the so-called yuha. That, you know, oh, I do katori shinto do, I do kashimi shinto do, that the Japanese warfare was codified in the yuha. And the best historical research people like Carl Friday, um, Michael Welt, et cetera, establishes that although information derived from the battlefield was included in these earliest, the most for real combat, uh, Yuha, uh, 
they were not military training per se. You start with the fact that as best the research I've read, I mean, it's not my research, it's other people's research, so I may misquote something to some degree. But what I recall is only 5% of Japanese before 1600 were ever enrolled in anything resembling a Jew. That's of the combatants. Mm. So 95% weren't joining Yagyu Shinkage Ryu, Katori Shinto Ryu, or something like that. Mm -hmm. They were getting military training. Mm -hmm. So the Yuha developed there was always an intermingling of kind of a spirituality with combatives in many cultures and Japan is no exception. It doesn't mean they were looking for enlightenment, but if you're going onto a battlefield, uh, if you may die, you say, is there anything that can protect me? And so one thing that might be able to protect you is you do a ritual to call the gods to your side, things like that. That began to intertwine. Some people found that through incessant training, and they say, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to, if I'm going to die, I'm going to die well, so I'm going to do a thousand spear thrusts a day. Mm -hmm. That affects your consciousness. It affects your mind. Mm -hmm. Some people, it makes you more peaceful. It makes you more calm. When you're more calm and more peaceful, guess what? You become more of a leader. So the Yuha really could be considered using information derived from combative engagement to inculcate the values that were those of the warrior class. So when you just a, one question I would jump in with, and that is that we when you talk about the, the training that these recruits, we call them recruits or or you know whatever have, they'd come in, they'd get this military training. When you said that, it, it kind of equated it almost like a like armies have done forever, which is okay, now you're, you're a raw recruit, we're going to give you some basic training to get you up to speed with what we expect you to do. Uh, and there'll probably be an initial period where, you know, right, this is what everybody needs to know. Now we're going to spend some time getting you, you know, on the same page with everybody else. And then once they go through that training, now you have like a deployment or, or where you're, you go serve your, your purpose. And if you're not at war right at that time, well, now you're basically going to be sitting around and well, why not? train or why not you know practice so you don't get rusty is that is that kind of how it went with at, at the time with with less military? so than you might think because the 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 uh the ashigaru for example when they weren't going to war they were probably farming sure or laboring right, right? so the people who are more aristocratic yeah mm. right this is really interesting but here's a significant thing um most of the early do have centered around the sword and even when you get a school like Shinto Ryu or some of the other really famous schools and they say, no, we're a, a Sogo Bujutsu, mm -hmm. which means uh, we train all aspects of combat. Mm -hmm. But in the vast majority of pattern drills, which are called kata, pattern drills are to inculcate certain reflexes, certain movements, certain technique by repeating the pattern over and over. The majority of pattern drills have the sword as part of it. Sword against naginata, sword against spear. And people say, wait a second, we've got five kata of spear against spear. Right? Fair enough. But the vast majority have the sword involved. And as soon as you bring that up, you basically said this is to some degree removed from preparation for the battlefield. Now, somebody can say the sword with its adaptability uh, puts people in all sorts of positions, challenges, certainly. I absolutely agree. I've experienced that. But most practically speaking, you would say, I've got a spear. I need to face a spear. That'd be number one, right? Things like that. So again, people can bring up their exceptions. I've got exceptions in the schools that I train of sword against Nagin a spear against Naginata, Spear against spear. I know those things existed. But the fact that the vast majority of training involved the sword suggests that something else was going on. Mm. And a, an interesting thing, I don't know historically exactly when it developed, but there was an analog to the Duha that goes by a variety of names, regional names, but one name is Bonote, which is uh, uh, Bo is staff and Te is hand. Um, and these were 
traditions where peasants trained with weapons in combative kind of dance skits that they would perform at festivals. Hmm. And they use the sarigama, they use sword, they use spear, and it's kind of acrobatic. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they exemplify peasant values. There's an exuberance, a joie de vivre, um, flamboyance. Hey, watch this. I'm going to do a total flip, and then you'll stab me through my straw hat, and I'll duck, mm -hmm. right, like that. Right. Very undignified from a bushy standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and in rural martial arts, rural, for example, Kirakiryu and Arakiryu, we're in a rural area. They've got some very flamboyant kata, very similar to these peasant dances, like throwing a chain over your shoulder, guys standing there, loop around the neck, and then you throw them by the neck with the chain. So, whoa, right? So there was an interpenetration in the rural areas of these more flamboyant peasant type things, because even the samurai in the rural areas were pretty peasanty, sure. right? So the way I see it is one of, I'm not saying this is conscious, but that you have developed to inculcate and maintain a certain mindset appropriate to somebody of the warrior class, which was, became increasingly delineated. A warrior does this, a warrior doesn't do this. This is the way a warrior sees life and death. This is how a warrior reads another person's psychology when in situations of danger. Here's how you, you, know, you manipulate another person face to face in combat. At the same time, the peasants were learning a thing that was entertaining. It took their mind off their incredible drudgery and it kept them weapons wielding. And so if you're practicing that stuff for your Matsuri two, three times a week or whatever, after hours, the, uh, in, in the Dyuha, people are doing their training in, in between all their duties. You are very ready to be trained specific to military issues when they come up. So well, I think what you're talking about there too is the difference between professional <laughs> soldiers or warriors and then conscript conscript troops that come from there they have other professions but they're called on when needed and they they because they're you know farmers blacksmiths fishermen what have bakers what have you you have a certain i shouldn't say you but they're whoever was kind of the ruler would say all right you mr baker you have to be ready when we call you and we expect you to to maintain a certain level of your training and I, I think back to the English longbowmen who were chartered to you have to practice so many you know shots but go about your business but in your spare time be ready when we call because you better show up and you better have the strength and the accuracy to to do what needs to be done like a, like any militia and they weren't they weren't shooting down people they were shooting targets right right, right. So that's not realistic it's not moving yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right nope. mm -hmm. so so the you have started to develop, you know, and we're not really sure every they, their claims as early as the 1300s, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of not lying. It's it's sort of you can say, well, it developed because it's connected to this, connected to this, connected to this, which is the same problem we're going to get to with Aikido, right? Warfare art, that same question. Connection, 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 connection. But at any rate, in the 1500s, these you have started to develop. And among them were Dyuha that emphasized close combat, Takenuchiryu, Arakiryu being two. And I like to focus on Arakiryu because Takenuchiryu, in my view, became more refined and sophisticated. And if you look at Arakiryu, among its earliest sets are five kata. The first one is the guy's got his back to you, tackle him, and then grab his neck and snap it as best you can. Right by sitting on it. Number two, guys in front of you, double leg takedown, retain your feet and step on his head. Mm. This is the first jujitsu kata, right? <laughs> right? So I could go on like that. Um, then there's the set of kata. I saw you did a little post on Hanmi Handachi. Mm -hmm. Well, among the first sets in Arakidu, it's a guy on his knees, he's got a knife. And another guy on his feet runs up and kicks him in the head 
and takes them down, neutralizes the attempt to stab you and takes them out or disarms them and takes them out. So in these original kata, the standing person wins. So why would you practice that so early in a hand-to-hand -hand thing? So again, why are you going hand-to-hand? -hand? Mm -hmm. think, think, think of what was derived from the battlefield. Mm -hmm. My weapon broke. Oh my God, I, got, I need a weapon. I'm going to get killed. Oh, there's that guy. He fell down. He looks a little wounded. He's got a weapon. I'm going to kick him in the head and disarm him. I'll not have a weapon. Sure. Or I'm going to take him. He's stunned. I'm going to take him prisoner. He looks high ranking. I'm, you know, I'm going to get ahead. I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. So, and then the next level of kata, often called kogasoku, it's one of the, it means light armor. But uh, in Takanuchi, it also means a, a, a short uh, knife. But at any rate, there are techniques which are grab, stab. Mm. Then you practice, you're unarmed, you're in a bad situation. They have a knife, you're probably going to die, but what are you going to do anyway? Right. Right? Mm -hmm. So when the person grabs you, can you turn the wrist to get a little kazushi to you know, get a little control to then avoid being stabbed? Mm -hmm. How about if there's a set of kata called hoben no dan, which means techniques of expediency, which really means you're really screwed. This is all you got left. Mm -hmm. You're on your knees. A guy comes up behind you and takes a knife and with two hands, one hand on this side, this puts it to your neck and ah, they're going to do this. So you reach up desperately and do a say oinage, a shoulder throw. Mm -hmm. You're on your knees. They're on their feet. What's your likelihood of success? Not great, but. That's better than nothing. <laughs> better than nothing. And if you do this move, you've ingrained a reflex that let's say you're going to get cut, but not deep enough to die. Mm -hmm. You drop the person on their head or whatever. You can maybe fight back, mm -hmm. right? So they're the techniques. When everything's desperate, here's what you should, here's the reflex you should have, mm -hmm. right? So certain schools, codified or emphasized one or another aspect of what was originally combatives that they found interesting. Mm -hmm. So schools like Araki do, which I train in or Takeuchi do, focused on this hand-to-hand -hand component, sort of pooling that out. They also have weapons of all kinds. Mm -hmm. Other schools could emphasize sword. They might have a component of certain, oh, it's close in, here's some jujitsu techniques. I want to just return briefly to EI. So Arakidu has kata where you're both on your knees. Now that's a simulation of rolling around in the muck. It's not some formal whatever. Right. You hit the ground somehow. Somebody knocks you from behind. You lose your spear. You're on the ground. You've got your sidearm, short sword or long sword. Another guy happens to be near you. And all of a sudden you're in a grapple. And in that grapple, can you pull your weapon at close range and cut them or clear your weapon so that you can... Uh, 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 stab them, mm -hmm. and then get back to your feet, of course, is the goal, mm -hmm. right? So that's, in a sense, I think should be considered the roots of EI. A weapon is not in your hand. How do you get it in your hand and edge on somebody mm -hmm. in a mess? And I think any, any modern police officer, law enforcement officer, uh, security guard practices drawing the weapon, drawing their, their sidearm to deploy it without fumbling, be able to do it quickly, smoothly, to get, to get it ready to go. Yeah, you know, and there's a, I'm associated with a group called Arrestling, which is a, a, a combative specifically developed for police by Don Gula. Um, and you can look up Arrestling on YouTube. And one of the techniques he developed is called a G-Rap. And the G-Rap is you draw your firearm and you grab the muzzle. Why? Because you're right on me. Mm -hmm. Now, people say, oh, I'll do the rock and lock. I'll step back and rock like that. Mm -hmm. You get disarmed all the time. Mm -hmm. This technique, you grab the muzzle and you fire here. And you say, well, the weapon's now out of battery. Exactly. But you've got one weapon on target, then elbow, elbow, smash in the face, step back, tap rack, and then you get a second round. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, if people are curious, there's a great YouTube video of the G-Rap on Gula. There's a lot of controversy about it because people are just so anxious about grabbing the muzzle. But he's basically saying, if you're disarmed, you got nothing. Right. So we're going to get one round center mass or up under the chin, and then we're going to fight them off so you can clear the weapon. 
then I can see by su supporting it that way, having the point the or the the barrel go offline from somebody trying to tip it or re-aim it would be very difficult. So it'd be easier yeah. to keep your keep that aimed right at the target it needs to hit. Yeah, yeah. So this is kogasoka in a modern uh, 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 or torite is another word for this in a modern context. So basically, we just did a very quick and dirty. So a trajectory of Japanese warfare to the 1600s when war stopped. Mm -hmm. And now people are training in the so-called yuha. Mm. Some of which the early Todite Kogosoku, like Araki do, Takeuchi do, Shosho do, um, have a close combat component, which was A, grab and stab, mm -hmm. and two, somebody grabs and stabs you. Is there any way you can neutralize that? Mm. Okay. But now we have 1600 to 1867, a period of mostly peace. People weren't doing hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And the samurai were training this stuff. And then later, even commoners, do you really want to get hurt? And what started to happen is this stuff became more and more refined. Oh, here's a more sophisticated way to bring that person to the ground. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll use Aiki, I'll use, you know, whatever. And there's a validity to studying sophistication, but what starts to happen is things that work at a quarter speed or quarter intensity don't work at full speed. Mm -hmm. um, I forget the names, but there's a, a, a Korean guy who was making a real stir on the internet for a while. The last name is Duk, I believe sort of a Sistema offshoot guy and a young, handsome guy and he, he'd imitate Bruce Lee, pa -pa! and then he'd do some else guy on a motorcycle and he'd pop him. And this, this British MMA guy said, this is all BS, I want to fight him. And they ended up having a boxing match. And um, it was bad because this Korean guy insisted on 20 ounce gloves and the referee was Korean and protected him and all that. So it was basically, he clinched and hung on. He did not at any point do a trapping move, uh, any of the moves that he really does beautifully well. It was a level of embarrassment. He was very sophisticated with his compliant guy, but it wasn't related to real fisticuffs, sure. as it turned out, right? Mm -hmm. So we started to, within Japanese martial arts, there was this period where things became more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. Um, and for a while, not tested at all, mm. or rarely tested. And so jujitsu became more and more refined. Now, even now, you could say, well, its roots are in battlefield, close combat, grab and step. Yes, mm -hmm. right? That's true. But it's become, to some degree, more and more distant from it. Mm -hmm. And then another thing happens, the cultural context is really different. So... At a certain point, I think really sparring really started to grow maybe in the late 1700s, early 1800s. And before you get to the sparring, one thing that strikes me about the grab and stab is that it does have a, that modern equivalent. And, it, and that is a hockey. <laughs> and you can see a hockey fight. You grab uh -huh. and punch. You don't have a knife or a dagger or, or a stabbing weapon, but you get attachment. Your target can't move. You can feel where they are. You pump and you, you're trying to shake them off their posture while you're pounding on them. And, yeah. and, I, and you know, we've seen even that in, in footage of, of actual fights. They don't look like a precise boxing match. They're like you know, two alley cats um, scrapping it out and, and getting that attachment. You know, I've heard the argument, and I'm sure we've all, all heard this argument of, well, nobody grabs in a real fight. Well, there's, they do, and there is a reason for it. Now, it may not be as common because somebody who has no idea how to fight may not occur to them to grab onto somebody so that they can, they can pound away and that the other person can't just back up and leave. Um, so I think that that's a, a, a fundamental of combat that goes all the way back to not only battlefield, but just host, hostile violence in general. Not that there's you know, polite violence, but uh, <laughs> that attachment's well, yeah. a, a factor. Well, the other thing is people have an illusion about short weapons based on movies. And since the most prominent short weapon uh, uh, systems come out of the Philippines mm -hmm. and 
the Philippines do trapping, but there's a, by all accounts, the Philippines seems to have had a dueling culture, one-on-one -on -one facing, two people draw a weapon and they do X, Y, and Z. That is not to say there's not ambush stuff done in the Philippines. I saw a little video of a guy who was a $10 assassin. That's all it takes for him to sh shoot and kill somebody. Wow. And he had this technique, he had this baggy trousers where... Oh, your microphone cut off. It's hard to show. So imagine, imagine this is my waistband, right? Okay. He's got his weapon tucked underneath the waistband and he's got his pants are baggy and he go pop and he just sort of hit it underneath. The weapon would pop in his hand, he'd shoot you and then walk away. Okay. Right? So I'm not saying that doesn't exist. So if you're in the Philippine martial arts, please understand. Mm -hmm. But there is a real, a real idea when people think about knife issues of one-on-one -on -one who's both the guys have a knife, a knife fight. Mm -hmm. And really we're talking about knife thing, taking somebody by surprise, two people in a clinch, all of a sudden a weapon is in one person's hand, he stabbed and says, I just felt him punch me. And then I was bleeding, right? Um, it, when you intend to kill somebody with a knife, you wanna make sure he doesn't tie up your hands and that you get that point or edge on that person's flesh many times as quickly as possible, and then you disengage. And that was what, that's what it's Japanese combatives with short weapons started out to be. But as Japan became a more modern, decent society, um, young men still wanted to test themselves. So how are you gonna test yourself? With swords, they started to use and develop bamboo replicas. Right? The issue though is, if you and I are fighting and we're both using classical techniques, I go, damn it, he just beat me again. And I realized, well, I'm six foot six. If I hit him one hand and reach out, I'm gonna hit him right in the head. I'm gonna smack him hard. I win. And somebody asks, if you might say, because you're a classicist, <laughs> that's no good because you couldn't, wouldn't really use a sword that way. And I'd be like, you lost. And so techniques started to change based on the sparring implement. What started to happen in jujitsu because young men were touring around from one jujitsu school to another and saying, for room and board, I'll fight you. And it was unarmed fighting. It wasn't people fighting with knives. So what became judo was already being developed in the 1800s on an informal basis as people, and a lot of times they didn't do a temi either, right? Mm -hmm. There'd be, sort of agreed upon rules, sometimes unspoken, you might be thrown on a rock in the garden. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, probably there wasn't much fisticuffs because again, this is cultural conservatism. Mm -hmm. um, since everybody did carry a weapon that was always in the back of your mind, you weren't practicing boxing. Mm -hmm. When karate hit Japan in 1920 from Okinawa, it was a revelation, oh my God. These guys do pugilism. Wow, this is strong. This is good. People didn't know what that was because jujitsu had a temi strikes, but not, not moving, bobbing, and weaving. Didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. So jujitsu has now changed bit by bit to being primarily, in people's mind, or more unarmed combat. Mm -hmm. right? And you trace, and, and so what also started to happen is the kata got flipped over. It could be armed combat, but I'm the unarmed guy in a civil society. You stab at me, I start to learn counters to that. That was existent in the oldest schools, but it started to be emphasized more and more and more. You still have the old grab, stab, I win. That's not very interesting. It's obvious. What's cool is, can I learn 17 counters to uh, all ending up in Shihonage? Mm -hmm. right? And so already, if you look at... 18th century jujitsu schools, you see things that look very, very much like um, Daitoju. Mm. Right. And you could make an argument, well, you know, that, that um, on the knees training they have, the roots of that are being close to the ground in a scuffle, mm -hmm. but since the Japanese were never big on play acting, like, okay, I'll sprawl out and you attack me, they're going to be in a kind of formal pose. Let's start. But it was understood we're practicing being on the ground. 
Sure. But then that later got codified within Japanese social structure. Now we're practicing in the palace, we're practicing seiza, mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. The interpretation of it changed, but you could say, yeah, the roots of it were um, mm -hmm. that in extremist thing that could happen on the battlefield. And, uh, you know, I can see that drift and that explains the, the why we see entire demonstrations where uh, Nage is, is on their knees and maneuvering around while they're doing multiple techniques where they have the opportunity to get back to their feet, but they don't actually do that. Um, mm -hmm. Where it's, you know, obviously the, that priority. And I, to me, this is that training priority of, sure, you might be on the ground, you might, your position may be compromised and you might have to react to a, an attack while you're there, but the, that however you react, A, you have to protect yourself and B, you have to get to your feet. And those are two very high priorities. Yeah, so let me add two points to that. Sure. One point is, um, People make a mistake when they say, well, this is a specialized training to make your hips strong and all that. Mm -hmm. Well, that might be a specialized training for you and I to make our hips strong because we didn't live the lifestyle that we naturally would have hips strong. If mm -hmm. you have lived your whole life in pre-modern Japan where you squat to defecate, where you walk just about everywhere you go, uh, when, when you're tired, you squat and you labor on a daily basis, you've got very strong hips, mm -hmm. right? That's, but on another level, um, and I think this is one of Daiko Yu's geniuses, is they realized that they could use this on the knees posture because you have a more stable base. Just a second, let's get a phone thing in the way. You've got a more stable base to really concentrate on keeping a stable base with forces going into one or another level of your body and you ground those forces and do a technique with integrity. Sure. It's on that level, it's easier to do that and easier to study it on your knees than it is on your feet. So as a training method, I think that's one of the geniuses of the Daiko you came up with to really emphasize that mm. as a training for postural stability. Mm. The second thing though, is it comes back to convention and conservatism again. Mm -hmm. One of my training brothers is named Crystal Blank, uh, and uh, um, he's a law enforcement officer and SWAT for 20 plus years and all that. And he's both a judoka and BJJ black belt. And when he practices grappling, whenever somebody pulls guard, his main thing is, how do I get free and back to my feet and disengage? Mm -hmm. And people get frustrated with him, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he doesn't take a full mount. He wants a one knee mount because he's always think he wants to train as he needs it for his weapons, right? Sure. Now, if he gets to guard, he, he'll be in guard, but his goal is how do I get to a tactical superior position as quickly as possible? Because if I'm pinned down here, somebody else can come up and kick me in the head. Mm -hmm. So, but people are like surprised. Mm -hmm. okay? That's my phone. I have to ignore that. <laughs> Speaking of the devil, that's just give me one second. Sorry, folks. All right, sorry about that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, among the majority of people doing BJJ, hey, let's roll, bro. Mm -hmm. And they're not getting to their feet, right? And you literally can do a training scar where there is an opening to scramble to your feet and get some distance. Be, no, 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 I, I'm in close, I'll do this or that which wouldn't be the best choice in a, a life-threatening situation. Mm -hmm. It's really easy though to uh, um, forget that. I love that term training scar. It's one I, that, that I kind of learned just recently, but it, it's such a great image of be careful about what you train and the, and the habits you, you ingrain in yourself because if that repeated execution can get you Go, going the wrong way and if if at a crucial time you need to for example like with that you need to get back up but your brain says every time i'm in this position i go i go down on the ground or i i engage you know in what would be you know poor position from a self-defense standpoint that yeah training scars great term for that that whole thing you know um, i'm i'm getting a plug so just a second here sure sure you know, my, my, my early, earliest years of serious training were in Aikido. And when I stopped being a regular Aikidoka, which was back in 1978, 
Um, and now I'm a visitor, uh, so to speak, you know. Um, but one of the reflexes I had, and I was considered a really good uke. Mm -hmm. I'm a tall guy, but people like Second Doshu used to love to call me out because you know, he's short, I'm tall. And I could, I could really flow with him. Mm -hmm. But I had a reflex that when I got pressure, my first response was to give. Mm -hmm. When I started doing judo and then later BJJ, I had to untie this training scar. Reprogram. Yeah, because certainly, you know, as, as you know, that famous phrase from Hickson Gracie, you flow with their go. Mm -hmm. But you also have to have, it can't be pure non-resistance any more than going to be pure resistance, right? You have to have a tensile relaxation. Mm -hmm. And I, I had a training score of, the, as soon as I had pressure, to move away from the pressure, because if it were ukemi, I was flowing into the uke mm -hmm. role, right? Sure. So, yeah, so, so, um, that train, if you will, on the one hand, what was developing in jujitsu in the 1800s was absolutely fitting of Japan's society at that time. Mm. And for somebody to time travel from 1550 and say, ah, oh, you know, that Shinai practice you're doing is really not good for the battlefield. Mm -hmm. It's like, imagine here we are, like somebody comes from 1776 and questions, you know, what we're doing in military training today, right? Right. Um, at the same time, when Japan ran into new problems, uh, modern warfare, et cetera, they did a, a bunch of rebooting. Like, for example, the first thing they did was with bayonet, they tried to copy the French method of bayonet fighting. Mm -hmm. They found it wasn't sufficient for various reasons. Then they went back and they dipped in the well of old spear fighting and adapted some stuff from spear fighting, put it within their jukendo, mm -hmm. which you have a different weapon. It's, you know, the, the, they had the replica weapon, which is a rifle with a, a mock blade on the end of it. But they incorporated some elements from spear. It was like this they had this treasure box of, of really good information that they could bring into modern times. Mm -hmm. but, but at any rate, uh, just to take that question, so now we have something like Daito Ryu and then Aikido. Mm -hmm. And you can trace a line from all the way back to the Yayoi period when the first uh, Turkic tribes type people on their mounted horse, the mounted horses, archers. Okay? You can trace this line all the way up and say, and we end up in Aikido. So of course it's got its roots on the battlefield. In that sense, sure. You could say the same thing about Morris dancing. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But the real question is, is um, uh, if you play with that metaphor, what aspect of that metaphor that Aikido, for example, is battlefield derived, mm -hmm. what aspects of that are relevant? Mm -hmm. And I think it's fair to say there are certain reflexes that you can develop in Aikido that you could spontaneously do that would be the right reflex in a situation, even in a modern day battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, tank up. I have a friend, a law enforcement officer. It's a long story. So the short version is uh, a giant man with a machete attacked him from running at him from 25 feet away. He fired one round. I believe he had a 45, I don't recall, but hit him right in the heart. Mm. The guy did not even pause. And he was running so fast that before the second round could be fired, he cut down right on his wrist. With the machete. And he'd been doing Shindo Musa Ryujo, which one of their most common movements is like our Aik in Aikido, the uh, Tenkan, it's just swivel like this to mm -hmm. you know go from frontal to absolutely sideways. Mm -hmm. And he just instinctively, not even knowing he did it, as the weapon is coming down, did that swivel. And so instead of getting his wrist cut off, the weapon hit the slide mm -hmm. just as he was firing. The second round 
then went off and took out the guy's femoral artery. Mm, okay. He was knocked to one knee. The, 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 my friend was knocked to one knee. Machete man with a bullet through his heart. Mm. One tore out his femoral artery, takes one step, whirls around and goes to cut again. And my friend managed to get the third round, jammed the weapon right under his chin. Mm -hmm. Kogosoku, mm -hmm. right? In fighting. Blew the guy, top of the guy's head off. Um, he's still standing. Wow. Okay. My friend scrambled to his feet. He did not go to infighting. Right. He backed up. He said he backed up 25 feet and his body touched his patrol car and it was like a switch went off and he went legless. <laughs> the adrenaline just cut off. He was on the ground, on, sitting on his butt with his weapon still pointed. Mm -hmm. The guy's just standing there swaying. No. Wow. And then fell over and died. Mm. Um, so we have a couple things there. One, thank God he's alive. Mm -hmm. Number two is a technique that you could have learned in an Aikido dojo. That's basic technique was what saved his life. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are techniques which are not training scars that they actually are in a specific technique, something viable. Mm -hmm. You know, my favorite Aikido teacher was a man named Kuruiwa Yoshio, who was a former professional boxer. And he said, the only thing relevant about Aikido is Ikkyo, Nikkyo, Sankyo, Yonkyo, Kodagaishi, Shihonage. And he says, this position is the technique. Everything that happens afterwards is just doing stuff in the dojo to call it Aikido. But it's, if you can get somebody in this position, the one o'clock position, you know, in terms of a Temi as a boxer, whatever. So it's, can you destabilize a person so they're in one of, these clock face twists. So in that sense, you could say there, Aikido is providing, if you pay attention to it, vital information that you could incorporate into any situation. The idea that Shihonage is your go-to technique for the battlefield is kind of silly. But you know, it is. And in, in, in fact, I, I think that um, you know, you could use the basic principle, and I think this is a sound concept that throughout history, fighting is fighting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, that shows in how many different things, aspects, techniques, what you want to call them, that you see echoed in many, from many different cultures. Uh, there's, or you could say there's really, in, in terms of fighting, there's nothing really new under the sun. There are no new inventions. Somebody's already done it before. Uh, you're kind of reinventing it. Um, but I do think that, you know, the application of, like you said earlier, the environment, the considerations um, are going to have nuanced differences. But the fact that, you know, fighting style really is never invented, it's just maybe rediscovered. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, and in my opinion, as we look into modern arts, really our goal is to uh, make sure that the art that we're doing is suited to the purpose, well suited to the purpose and environment that we want it to fit into. And uh, that's, I think, where, I, at least with Aikido and, and other martial arts have had this too, where they lose their relevance because there is a mismatch between what the art is trying to study or, or to replicate or to preserve compared to the, the relevance of, for example, a self-defense where, you know, and, I, and I'll say that only because a lot of, almost everybody that goes into martial art, some kind of martial art in the back of their head they think, I, I want to be able to use this for self-defense. I'm not just doing this as a purely academic study. There, there is something here to that. That's what attracts them to that. But it's the delta between the, you know, an art that's made for a Philippine mud environment versus a, you know, first world urban type environment. Um, so that, so that's, the, that's that mismatch part that, that arts can get caught in. Well, let me throw something out to you. Mm -hmm. So if you talk about that and you say, what, I want this for self-defense. Mm -hmm. th one of the, I think it might've been Henzo Gracie was asked about BJJ for self-defense. If you're concerned about self-defense, you need a firearm. Mm -hmm. You just said that, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if self-defense is physical combatives as what's my role in society, mm -hmm. right? I don't these days, but my role used to be going alone to people's houses who were in serious mental disturbances. Mm. So 
Should I be carrying a weapon? Should I not be carrying a weapon? What weapon should I carry? Um, then there's the legal ramification. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're a crisis intervention psychotherapist. You just stab somebody. You walked in their house and you stabbed them. You were prepared to do that, weren't you, Mr. Ander? Mm -hmm. Right? When could, could you not have left? Why did you stay and stab them? And right or wrong, right? But self-defense has to take that into account, mm -hmm. right? Um, if, you know, if, 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 if I don't want to be attacked on the street, if I always carry um, uh, openly an explosive vest and a, a, a dead man's trigger, say, you come near me, we're going up together, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so the, the, I think it's an interesting question when you say, what's self-defense? To what degree will it actually make you safe across the board sure. when you consider how likely Boy, that could be a whole nother episode right there <laughs> sure right mm -hmm. yeah um if you know if i walk around there was a time in my life i walked around with so much attitude not saying anything but you know my basic way when i would engage with people is like this right and i thought i was being friendly right because i was getting so warped with what i was doing and you know it was like i was i was inviting the worst thing from people right um i was more physically fit than i am now i was quicker right you know, all that sort of thing but i don't think i was as well protected as i am now ironically mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. so uh, so i think that's an interesting question when you look at aikido you start with okay what am I being offered in this dojo? Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing you asked. What am I being offered? And if somebody were to say to me, this is the epitome of hand-to-hand -hand combat as practiced by Japanese warriors rooted in the midst of time, well, that's BS. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think that's the short form answer to, for the question of what this whole episode is about. Is, <laughs> is that is that a, a reasonable illusion to, to hold on to or, or, or a and I, and I think you, you nailed it. And I totally agree that it's romantic. It may get, uh, you know, as they say, put butts in the seats. It may, if you have that in your brochure or on your website, it may draw people in that are, that love that mystic samurai thing, but you're, that, that really is not, not what you're delivering. Right. So, so let's take a couple other sort of opening statements. Um, Aikido is a martial arts that's derived from classical Japanese combatives. We use weapons like uh, staff and sword to study timing, distance, and courage. Um, we try to make our techniques strong, and at the same time, we have woven them in a Japanese context. The reason we retain the Japanese context is by participating in the physical movements that are rooted in another culture, it expands our understanding of what it is to be a human being. We could drop all the cultural stuff, but we would lose something, which is that tension between considering who I am, as opposed to based on the movements that were handed down, who those people were. And so that that's a different kind of statement, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if somebody says, well, the purpose of Aikido is the unification of all humanity and practicing Aikido uh, makes, makes you a better human being. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, why was Aiki Hoshi a war criminal who ran the prison camp at the River Kwai, uh, one of Osensei's top students, right? Why was so-and-so? Why was so-and-so? Why was so-and-so really not a very nice person where his exact contemporary, uh, Shirata Sensei, was among the finest human beings? Mm -hmm. That the two of them studied at the same time. They slept in the same dojo one became exemplary and one certainly wasn't, right? Mm -hmm. They practice the same. So is the art magic? You know, so, so when people offer certain things, I think it's fair to question, is what your advertisement or definition is it congruent with what's being produced? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's like I, I, there's schools that I love to visit and train at, like uh, Aikido of Pittsburgh and in Etna. Mm -hmm. Those are really tough, strong people. They've got a community. They talk about self-protection. Anybody in that dojo knows if they're having some sort of trouble, and I'm not just talking about the Vikings raiding their home, right? 
if somebody's in trouble, they know they can call other people in the dojo and help will be on the way, mm -hmm. right? They, they're, they're, they're a community. They practice hard, they practice tough. Um, it's something totally different than ring boxing or, or something like that, but it's got its own integrity. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's the question. Once, uh, when somebody pronounces an advertisement that's manifestly not, not true, it's worth walking away from, in my opinion. And then the and I think that as as people that are looking around, you know, lay people look that look at Aikido uh, and how it's commonly portrayed, and the, even with a tiny little bit of their their own perception, they can see that there's the promise is not being delivered. It's the kind of the choreographed practice is way far off of anything else that they see and can compare. You know, because a lot of people, whether they're shopping for martial arts or not, even if they're just kind of interested in looking at martial arts, kind of kicking tires or however you want to do it, would say that just doesn't look anywhere near like anything you would see in any other realm of actual violence, whether that's, you know, sport or um, surveillance videos of, of actual sure. video uh, conflicts, violence. Um, and that's and that I think, where there's a separation. And that could be good or bad, mm -hmm. right? In other words, you, you know, it, it's it, it, the, the second outline I have offers something that's simply going to um, Krav Maga or us trademark, you know, is not going to offer. Right. Um, and then you have somebody, my understanding of what you're trying to do is an interesting tension mm -hmm. to maintain uh, some of that cultural information maintain its roots in in Japanese culture and a Japanese martial tradition, and then asking the question, what could I do with this basic movement or basic technique to make it effective? And in what circumstances would it be effective? Mm -hmm. Right? Um, and I think that's interesting. You know, uh, the people doing that, uh, what isn't interesting is to me, is you end up throwing out most everything. And then I'd say, well, there's another martial art you should be doing, that you're looking for something that already exists. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. yeah. And with the, even with the cross training that, I was, that I'd been doing for quite some time now, getting into wrestling and pugilism and many different martial arts, when I initially saw them and started you know, getting trained in them and practicing, I'd say, boy, this looks so different from the Aikido that I'm studying. It it's, mm. seems like there's no connection, but the, lo the longer I did it, I saw many, many connections. Mm -hmm. um, some were not very obvious and others were just hit you right off the bat. It was like, wow, this looks exactly like what Aikido does, only just a little less stylized, a little more focused on function yeah. than aesthetic. Because yeah. consider this, um, a lot of these things that people criticize Aikido for if you're talking about self-defense, could you not criticize boxing? Oh yeah. Right? And yet people don't because boxing is boxing, mm -hmm. right? It is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, among the most sophisticated use of the hands of any activity in the entire world and footwork and all of that. The sweet but, science. Right? Mm -hmm. and so it's, it's one thing to say, you know, I'm looking for the ultimate combative, and I'm not saying good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah, if, if that's a necessity, then let's, and then you say, in this modern context. Or, you know, like in my Arakiryu, which is from the 16th century, I've got strict parameters on what I'm going to do, but within those parameters, I have made changes, because I know some things that are, are better done one way as opposed to another, because I've tested them. Sure. Now, they're parameters, right? I'm not going to take my sarigama, my chain and sickle, and say, well, piano wire would be better. And so I'm going to get rid of the chain, right? Yep. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that that perfection part, because I've seen, I run into so many arguments from, from martial artists where the they fall into that, the trap of the perfection, perfection is the enemy of the good, or the perfect is the enemy of the good, where they say, well, it, it, you can never be inv invincible. So why why bother trying? And to me, that's that's very much a defeatist attitude. Really, the question is, can I be better? Can my art be a little better? Can it be more versatile, more practical, have fewer holes, fewer vulnerabilities? I, as a martial artist, can have fewer deficiencies and a better understanding 
generally. Um, you know, and, and I guess it's up to each person to choose how hyper-specialized their art gets versus how much they want to be kind of a, a more broad generalist that, um, you know, and I think from a self-defense or self-protection standpoint, you don't want to have any big gaping holes where, you know, for example, you've never trained anything against, against a kicker and you run across a, a, a pretty good kicker who annihilates you because you have no experience with it. And I think the best example is somebody that just runs up and tackles you because, I mean, anybody that's done a little bit of high school football or even just has got brothers they wrestle with, they know that they tackle somebody and usually they're like a fish out of water. So, well, you know, the, the, what you just said is that's how BJJ got created. Pretty much, yeah. Um, you know, Tomita, who was one of the great judoka, an older man, and Maida were touring and at West Point, uh, they'd done their judo demonstration and some young West Point kid gets up and says, well, you know, I did this and he tackled Tomita with a double leg, right? Mm -hmm. It fell down. Mm -hmm. um, and Maida ended up, so the legend goes, you know, BJJ. I'm sure it was sure. a little more complicated than that. But, yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, you know, we since Bruce and I, Bruce Bookman and I were on your show before, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, Bruce is like an exemplar where he teaches classical Aikido. At his dojo, they maintain mostly through his son, but Bruce still teaches classical BJJ. And he has his Aiki extensions, which is a consideration within Aikido of Muay Thai type kicks, some grappling, and then has added the work that he and I have done together regarding um, taking staff and sword and making something that has as much integrity as possible while being, what's the right word? not at variance with the Aikido principles that he's teaching. Mm -hmm. And I, I love the way he walks that tightrope because nobody could walk in his door and say, oh, he's ruined Aikido. I think he's got some of the best Aikido in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot more uh, room for, for exactly that kind of thing than, than a lot of Aikido practitioners give credit to. Um, you know, and I've seen, unfortunately, I've run across some extraordinarily narrow minds when it comes to here's what, what Aikido is. And if it's outside of this little gap right here, it's not Aikido. Um, but I, holding to, you know, the principles of, and I, I'd say pretty much one of the best first principles is taking on an alternative view that the way to, to survive is to do so much damage to somebody that they cannot harm you anymore like the typical military type of, you know, I would say Krav Maga would describe, would be, you know, the art that most people think of with the, just cause immense amount of damage to the point where they don't yeah. want to play anymore. Certainly uh, the original Krav Maga. Right? Yeah, the original. yeah, exactly. And, and that art, like every art evolves as time goes on. And, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've met some Krav Maga instructors here in the, in the metro area that, and trained with them and they've taken on, I've seen the, the, where they are at now, which is, their attitude is, I don't want to have to utterly destroy you. I will do as much as I need to, to make sure that I'm not uh, harmed. So they're taking, they're almost becoming more of a civ uh, civilian type uh, rules of engagement than the military where it came from, which is, I don't have any regard for you whatsoever. In fact, if I can kill you in two seconds, I will do it. One second is even better, you know, so um and that's where one of the things that I really adore about, about Aikido and, and any art that takes on, all right, this is for civilians to use. This is not about just annihilating your enemies. Um, and I think that that's why, why modern Aikido is, is like that. But I want to get back to just kind of wrapping up with where we started this, which is when you say that this art comes from the Japanese battlefield, it often creates that image of I'm a killer. I'm a killer on on a, on a war ground and I am going to annihilate my opponent. And it's a long path to go to say, well, if this is really about using just appropriate level of response versus tear somebody's head or you know, cut somebody's head off, you know, that's kind of a long way to go as well in philosophy, not even just in, in the application, like what we've been talking about from a, you know, hand to hand combat thing into, all right, now this is a, uh, an art that is between non-armored people, and that's another factor of uh, which we could go into more. But I think we're pr probably have, have covered this pretty well. Of you know, you don't 
necessarily have to harm somebody by throwing them to the ground because they're not armored. You don't have to get through a suit, a suit of armor to, to affect them or, or to uh, you know, take control of them. Um, so I think that you know, every art evolves over time. It's just what does it evolve into and why? And uh, you know, I think with Aikido, it, it sort of had that, and I was glad to have this discussion because the expectation that what modern Aikido is goes to the battlefield is one of those that we need to understand better. Um, you know, and I'm not even going to say that it's a total myth and everybody needs to stop saying it, but realize if you do say it, know that you're kind of you're on a thin <laughs> you're on real thin ice <laughs> honestly it's like you know what, what's it uh the olympic winter olympic biathlon mm -hmm. I didn't say it right you know right. where you ski you shoot you do stuff and that's supposedly derived from the skills that a soldier needed to have in winter a sniper war, yeah mm -hmm. right um it's not military training mm -hmm. It's easy to and un unambiguously to say, well, this is derived from one concept of what were the requirements of a soldier at a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And similarly, yeah, Aikido has its roots very clearly in hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. Mm -hmm. But it's become something very different and not just because uh, Ueshiba Morihei um, had a spiritual revelation. And so he said the, you know, these acts are for the reconciliation of the world. Mm -hmm. That's one whole discussion, that's something else. But I'm saying that technically what he did with the Daito Ryu he learned and what Daito Ryu people did with, you know, whatever came before and came before, came before, mm -hmm. it permutated over time. And you can say, yeah, the roots were this, but it's not that now. So then the question is, so what is it and what's it for? Sure, exactly. Well, Ellis, this has been a fantastic discussion. I, I uh, had very high expectations of it, and it went well beyond that. So I very much appreciate your time, and, and uh, I think people are going to get a lot out of this episode. Thank you. So, All right. Take care, and we will talk to you again real soon. All right, Tristan. Thank you. You bet. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this discussion. Stay tuned for more episodes. I've got some great stuff on the way very soon. In the meantime, enjoy your training.